happy to be here and uh, we'll try to give you a very condensed story of BioInvent, where we are at the moment and the current status. Obviously, we are listed in Stockholm, as everybody knows, so this is our forward-looking statement. And then I would like to start with a quick a snapshot of the company. So what we're doing at BioInvent, and obviously BioInvent is an expert in antibody discovery and development, but we have refocused a little bit in that sense that we are currently leveraging, as it says on this slide here, cancer biology knowledge, immunology, and then antibody uh, expertise. And we're a little bit different to a lot of companies, so we are really pushing ahead with a broad portfolio. As you can see, we have currently five clinical projects running, and uh, by next year, actually, we'll start our program number six. And this is possible since we are a quite integrated company, so we do uh, discovery of targets and antibodies based on a function screening approach, which I will explain to you quickly on the next slide. Uh, we have our own in-house manufacturing capabilities and then, of course, also do clinical development. The technology has been nicely validated through a number of collaborations, so currently you have antibodies at phase one and phase two with a number of companies such as Daiichi, Bayer, Mitsubishi Tanabe, Takeda. But we're also commercializing our platform, so we have successfully concluded a deal with Pfizer um, a little bit more than a year ago and then in, um, executed a new deal with Exelixis during the summer with a nice upfront of 25 million uh, US. We're also quite proud that we have a strong international shareholder base, so we have a number of uh, US as well as uh, European blue chip investors, and uh, currently a very solid uh, cash position that we have generated through uh, financing. So we did very successful financings uh, this year, last year, and the year before, uh, but also deals. So we did our first uh, out licensing deal for our lead program, and then, as I mentioned, the Exelixis deal uh, commercializing our platform. And those deals, just to mention it, those are all, uh, you know, structured in the same way. They're upfront payments, um, they're milestone payments, and at the end, then um, um, double-tiered uh, royalties in some cases. So just very briefly, I will not dwell on that uh, too long. Uh, the platform that we have uh, is called FIRST, and I will just focus on the most important uh, unique features. Number one, uh, we're screening directly on human patient material. So we have a very close collaboration with the local hospital here in Lund, such that we receive high quality, fresh material on a regular basis. And this then we use uh, to screen our high quality ENCODA antibody library. And uh, I just had a chat at the beginning with uh, Karl Borbeck. He was one of the inventors of this uh, very high quality antibody collection. Once we have specific antibodies that are recognizing the cells of interest, uh, before we really uh, analyze what they're binding to, we subject those uh, in, in a number of animal models, so we really screen for therapeutic effects. And once we have seen that uh, a certain target antibody combination has a strong therapeutic effect in a number of animal models, then we discover the target. And that's uh, what we use in order to build our own portfolio but it's exactly the same platform that we have used uh, in the Pfizer collaboration as well as also using now in the uh, Exelixis uh, collaboration. So with that platform, we have built this uh, strong portfolio, multiple shots on goals. So as I said, currently five programs uh, running, and we're currently focusing on three targets. Uh, FC gamma R2B is a very interesting target uh, for cells of the innate immune system. And there we have uh, three programs go going, two different compounds. So our lead is 1206, which is currently running in non-Hodgkin lymphoma, as well as in solid cancer, in combination with rituximab, as well as uh, pembrolizumab. And then we have our second uh, anti-FC-gamma-2B antibody that has just started uh, clinical development, in combination with plastuzumab. Then uh, on T-regulatory cells, we're targeting TNF receptor 2, which is one of the hot and upcoming targets. Uh, we are still leading the pack, so when we started the program, we were one of two. Uh, now there are a couple of companies uh, running preclinical as well as clinical programs, uh, but we will be the first one and have already uh, presented first data on our lead program, 1808. And then we have a second program, uh, 1910, which is still uh, in preclinical development, but should go into the clinic um, next year. 
Uh, then we have a program that we run in collaboration with Transgene. This is a 50-50 joint venture where we combine our proprietary anti-CTLA-4 uh, with their oncolytic virus platform. And that it also has started clinical development um, early last year. Just a comment on the names here. So, as I mentioned initially, so we have partnered 1206 with Kasi Pharmaceuticals for uh, China, Hong Kong, Macau, and uh, Taiwan. And then we have a number of uh, uh, supply and clinical collaboration agreements, as already introduced, for instance, by, by Pair with Merck. And you get uh, Pembro for free, uh, but you also get a lot of input in your clinical trial design since uh, Merck is one of the leaders or the leader for anti-PD-1 uh, uh, antibody development, our target development. So now we'll go through the uh, various programs very briefly. So this is 1206 that we're currently developing in two um, um, disease indications on so non-Hodgkin lymphoma. They were targeting FC gamma 2 b when it's expressed directly on the tumor B cell. And there we have received uh, first a proof of concept, and we'll come back to the data later. Um, and then we are also developing in, in solid tumors, and there we're targeting FC gamma 2 b when it's expressed on the dendritic cells in the tumor microenvironment. So there's only modulatory, whereas in the non Hodgkin lymphoma, it's uh, inhibiting the uh, resistance mechanism to um, anti-CD20, but also adding uh, um, e efficacy itself. In the solid tumor, I will come back, we also have seen first uh, encouraging uh, results. Just very briefly, in the non-Hodgkin lymphoma, so we're not focusing currently on all non-Hodgkins, but on mantle cell lymphoma, marginal zone lymphoma, and follicular lymphoma. We have orphan designation for follicular lymphoma and uh, marginal uh, zone lymphoma, or mantle cell lymphoma, sorry. And this is the study design. So important is that we're focusing on patients who are not responding anymore to anti-CD20-based therapy. We have successfully concluded the dose escalation, and we are currently in uh, dose expansion. Then all the data that we have uh, shown uh, so far, so this is uh, from the dose escalation only. Uh, we saw a very nice overall response rate, and, and most importantly, we have three complete responses of high quality. That means they're enduring for a long time. As you can see, 12, 24, and 36 months, and the longest now is uh, two, month, uh, two years 24 months after the end of treatment without any additional treatment. So it's still in complete response. And that's something that the regulatory authorities really would like to see. And then on top, of course, we had the mix of partial responses, stable disease, uh, et cetera. So uh, what are the next steps for 1206 in non-Hodgkin lymphoma? So we have selected a dose for part two that's already done. So as since we endorse expansion, uh, we had a very successful end of phase one meeting with the FDA, and we also have started to include China in the global clinical development uh, strategy, uh, and they already are, are recruiting patients. The next step is really that we start evaluation of the subcutaneous formulation. So we have developed uh, or started to develop early last year sub, sub Q formulation of 1206, which should go into the clinic at any time point soon. Everything is ready, and we're waiting for the first patients to uh, be enrolled. Then on the solid cancer study, so it's a similar design, but here we're focusing on patients who do not respond anymore to anti-PD-1 and anti-PD-L1 therapy, and we're still in uh, dose escalation. And we have a summary. So basically, um, we have early observations that we can really um, reverse metastatic disease. So we have two uh, very nice responses, two very nice partial responses, uh, where we could really reduce the metastatic burden and uh, so basically what we're doing now is uh, going forward in order to re re find the recommended uh, dose for part two. And then we will also introduce the sub-Q formulation into the solid cancer trial as well. So we start with the non hodgkin lymphoma. Once we see it works there, and then go into the uh, solid cancer. So still earlier this one, but also quite promising uh, regarding the uh, responses that we have seen so far. So when we look at the uh, universe of 1206, you see it here on the right-hand side. So we're currently in indolent and Hodgkin lymphoma. Uh, we're doing also solid cancer. Currently, it's all comers, but then in the dose expansion, we'll focus on metastatic melanoma, non-small cell lung cancer. And then, of course, from there, we have the potential to go into other solid tumors. 
And there's on top autoimmune disease uh, application potential, which we're not exploring ourselves. We have set up a couple of collaborations in order to explore the possibility and to establish the preclinical uh, proof of concept. 1607, this is our second anti epsilon R2B, and the main difference is really, you see it on top, it's uh, engineered in that sense that it has a different mode of action compared to 1206. So it's FC silent, basically. And we are currently running the study, and um, the part one, as is mentioned here, is running in Spain, UK, Germany, and the US. And uh, at the end, we'll focus then on uh, gastric cancer, breast cancer, and gastroesophageal cancer. And that study has just started uh, this summer. Then on the second part of the portfolio, the uh, T regulatory cell uh, targets, um, TNF receptor 2 as well as uh, CTLA4. And I jump right into the study of um, 1808, which is our lead program uh, targeting TNF receptor 2. And you can see we're testing it currently in, as a single agent. And we have finished the uh, dose escalation. And uh, we have decided, based on the very good uh, toxicity profile, to go one dose even higher, because uh, Project Optimus, probably every, everybody knows this, so dose escalation, dose finding is very important, and, and that's what we do. And then we will be soon ready to go into uh, dose expansion for the uh, single agent arm, and there we focus on non-small cell lung cancer, ovarian cancer, and CTCL, which is a rare T-cell lymphoma. And that's strategically quite interesting, because that could provide a direct path to registration. We have kicked off also the combination with pembolizumab. Uh, that's currently running, so a very brief, short dose escalation. And then from where we will also go in the, uh, into non-small cell lung cancer and ovarian cancer. Then very quickly on the uh, last program, uh, this is BT001, the combination of our proprietary anti-CTLA4 with an oncolytic virus platform. We received uh, a very nice prize. We were the winner of the best uh, 2020 GRTC uh, Oncolytic and Local Immune Therapy Paper Award. And the study is summarized here, so we're currently in dose escalation, uh, tested as a single agent, and then we will start soon the um, combination with pembolism up here as well. Uh, and what we have seen so far, it's safe. Uh, we can really show that, uh, that that's the purpose to um, express the antibody only uh, in the solid tumor environment, no systemic exposure. I think we could show that. And we saw also first uh, you know, re reduction in, in tumor load, which is quite nice. And uh, you know, as I said, we will start the uh, combination with pembolizumab uh, next year. This is just very briefly the pipeline that we have outside uh, with our partners. And then at the end, and that's the last slide, is the uh, key catalyst, and you can see we have a full slate of programs that will read out during the first half and then new ones that will start during the second half. This is also on our web page. And then the, the last sentence is that we will have a R&D day on December 8th, where so we'll present uh, this quite dense program. That's why it took also a little bit longer time uh, in more than uh, in, a, in a couple of hours. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Jonas, by all means. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. I um, was curious to see, uh, you have a strong clinical platform and you have several partnerships going on. And um, in the light of AstraZeneca's um, acquisition of Nugen that was announced today, I'm just curious to see if you, if you see BioInvent as an acquisition target and what would your, what's your long-term strategy? So the strategy for the company is basically to develop a successful company. But uh, taking what you say, that's obvious. You know, we have a platform that can generate new mode of action. That's our sweet spot. We can translate quickly into the clinic. We have a rich portfolio. Yes, uh, it's a quite natural or might be a quite natural path for the company. So it's all about the price tag then? <laughs> Well, it's, it's about price, obviously, and uh, the right timing. But as I said, so internally in the company, we're just focusing on executing of our plans because then the success will drive those kind of strategic opportunities by itself. Well, as you had to hurry a little bit there towards the end, I wanted to ask you about the, the pipeline. You do have, um, you have some clinical programs that are run by external 
parties. Correct. Could you tell us a little bit about those and what, what's the aim with the development yeah. of those? That was the second last slide. So basically we have, and I don't recall uh, exactly, five to six clinical programs ongoing with Daiichi, Mitsubishi, Takeda and Bayer. Uh, and those antibodies, they are in development uh, either phase one or phase two. And uh, obviously we don't uh, control those programs because uh, for, for I present it here because it's a strong validation of our platform that not only BioNVent picks uh, antibodies for clinical development but also those pharma companies. But there could be a significant value because uh, you know, we got upfront payments, obviously you saw with the Exelixis deal, we got 25 million US, uh, US dollar upfront. And then you have uh, near term milestones as well as clinical milestones, commercial milestones, and then tier royalties. So I, I think it's a significant potential sitting there. Yeah. But the main value driver, obviously, is our own portfolio. Of course. So with five clinical programs running now, uh, how do you divide your internal resources? Well, we have grown significantly. So uh, when I joined the company roughly a little bit more than four years ago, we were something between 50 to 70 people. Don't recall exactly. Now we are around 100, still growing. Uh, especially the clinic group has, has grown, uh, but also the other two functions, uh, also the manufacturing actually to make sure that we always have material because we produce our own clinical trial material. So it's basically uh, to have the right resources and, uh, and that's also why we have been quite active in, in financing. You know, we raised uh, during the last four years deals and financing together 260 million US. I can see that Mike is looking at me, so he wants something. <laughs> My question was actually directly towards your last comment. So what's your secret behind that tremendous success in raising capital? Um, yeah, <laughs> secret. It's a lot of, uh, it's a lot of hard work. Uh, so basically you crank the wheel. And I think uh, the main point probably, uh, and that might be uh, a message to, to other CEOs, uh, don't pay too much attention to your shareholders that say, oh, we're getting diluted, etc. Et Nobody has died of dilution. Yeah? And I rather, so I'm not talking about myself, have a small share that is really has a multiple of five, then let's say 10% and it has a multiple of zero. So I think that's the main thing. So I, I got support to really do uh, you know, multiple financings. We always, also to mention this, um, did it as a premium. To the, to the share price, so there was never a discount, always out of strength. So what we did, we combined it all always with strong milestones. So this summer it was combined with the Exelixis deal that we did. So we did the deal, announced the deal, and a week later we did the financing. The financing before we did after the first proof of concept data. So we basically prepared everything. So what I always ask my CFO is, get everything ready, we might do a financing. And then we come out with the milestone, and then start the non-deal roadshow, and then a week afterwards normally we close the deal. So it's a, it's a good plan and then execution and don't feel inhibited. <laughs> I might be simplifying, but I understand that in the very beginning you mentioned that you, your novelty is in the way you identify the target. How is it that you, um, it seems like you have a lot going on. Do you have expertise from target identification all the way to clinical trials? So how Correct. did you manage that? Yeah. Well, the company was around for some time when I joined, so there was a very strong um, scientific preclinical team led by Björn von Deus, who was the CSO since quite a while. So that was already in place. Uh, we had a manufacturing team that we have grown a little bit, but also a, a team with a lot of experience. And then what we really have grown th throughout the last couple of years is the clinical development team. So there's a history behind. And I think I was just lucky that uh, there was already uh, some investment rounds that have invested in certain parts of the company. Uh, and, and at the end, if you have all these three parts together, it's much more efficient, it's much more quick, it's also cheaper. But of course, the investment in order to get there is significant. Yeah? And I was just lucky that parts were already there. Yeah. That's why I joined also the company. I think we will hold there. And um, thank you, Martin. <laughs>